Welcome to Lunch with the Lord. I'm Pastor Mark, and we are continuing our series of messages here on false teachers in 1 Timothy chapter 6. We will be continuing in verse 3 and probably getting into verse 4 this lesson. But before we begin, Jeremiah 15, 16, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Now, he says here in the first part of verse 3, which we saw last lesson, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, and we saw that very quickly, it says, if and it is true that there are false teachers who teach otherwise, they teach doctrines and teachings of a different kind, and they consent not. It means that they refuse to be drawn to the truth, to humble themselves and to give themselves to the truth of the gospel. And, and it says, and not to wholesome words, not to the, to the teachings that bring health and bring, uh, that are hygienic to our soul and our spirit, that build us up in God. They're not healthy teachings but they are teachings that that draw us, that lead to a sick spirit, a sick soul. So he says, they consent not to wholesome words. And then it says, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this brings up two issues. When it says here, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, the first issue is this, that it is possible that at this time, at this time in history, when, when Paul wrote to Timothy, that there were manuscripts being circulated that had Jesus' sayings in them, or that there were other gospel narratives being circulated by qualified writers. Now, the Bible that we have today is the one God has chosen for us. These letters are the ones God's chosen for us to have today. But is it possible that there, you know, Jesus had 12 disciples, well, actually 11, right? And what about Bartholomew? What about, about um, uh, you know, the, other, the other disciples? Uh, Thaddeus. And, 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 and Simon, right? What about these, these other apostles? Did they write anything down? Did they write, I don't mean a whole letter, but did they, did, did they write down Jesus' words and uh, uh, of what he said in situations? Maybe completely different situations that we don't have written here. It did, maybe they were handed down uh, through word of mouth sayings of, of Jesus. So, it's very possible that there were uh, handed down uh, other sayings of Jesus in situations that they heard him, his, his disciples heard him say when they were walking from Jericho to, to uh, Jerusalem or from Jerusalem up to the Sea of Galilee or wherever on these roads. There's much time and Jesus could say a lot of things and and, and they could remember them and hand them down by word of mouth or writing them down and circulating them around the world, or at least the known world at that time. So when he says here, they don't submit even to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, the first issue is that, yeah, there, it's possible that there were other manuscripts, there were other phrases that Jesus said, sayings that he said that were circulating around at that time. But the second issue that it brings up is that there were many wise men and philosophers and so-called prophets who were traveling around the known world to give their knowledge and wisdom to whoever would receive it. So he's saying here, that they need to give, they need to, to speak the words of our Lord Jesus Christ in contrary to some traveling prophet or some who knows 
uh, some traveling uh, philosopher or wise man who goes around and says, you know, wonderful sayings or, or wise words and, and, and has all kinds of viewpoints on things. No, we need to hear the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. What did Jesus say? Not some, you know, prophet or of, of, of who, whatever God somewhere or some wise person says, some philosopher from somewhere. No, it's not their words which bring healing. It's not their words which, which create a healthy soul and a healthy spirit. It's the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. So the wholesome doctrines that we are to receive should always result in having a proper attitude of reverence and respect towards God. So these false teachers did not have a respect towards God, were not teaching healthy doctrines, and they were not speaking the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if they did, they would be teaching doctrines which are in accordance with godliness. And that's what these false teachers, that they when they teach, they do not promote godliness. These false teachers did not want to teach anything about Jesus Christ's words or anything that would lead people to have a godly life. They wanted to teach whatever, their own version, their own view of, of the world, their own view of, uh, of life, right? Their own approach. They wanted to teach maybe someone, someone else's uh, view from hundreds of years before or, or whatever. But they did not want to teach uh, the words of Jesus Christ and word uh, and, and uh, doctrines that lead to a godly life to godliness in our, in our walk with God. Now, that leads me to this. Last lesson I know I mentioned, but I wanted to, I wanted to say this, that concerning the false teachers and, and what we need to be aware of today, and I wanted to give to you the thir 13 cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith. 13 cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith. The first one is the virgin birth. The second one is the hypostatic union. Now, hypostasis means that, hypostatic union means that God came in the flesh and dwelt among us, okay? So, and that's, a, that's the problem that John had with 1 John. Uh, the reason why the letter of 1 John was written was because that there were people that did not teach that Jesus came in the flesh. They felt that uh, these, these false teachers believed that, well, God is, is, is a spirit and he's holy and he's righteous. He would never come into a sinful body, into a body that's, you know, a materialistic body. God would never unite himself with, with, with a human body, right? So, and John deals with that in his first letter. So, hypostatic union. The third is the second coming of Christ. And the fourth is salvation by grace through faith. Not salvation by works, not anything that, that sounds like human effort at all. Salvation by grace through faith. Number five, the inspiration and the infallibility of the word of God, right? When, when we're listening to a preacher or a teacher, do they believe that the, that the Bible is the word of God? Infallible, no mistakes, the, it, that God, it was God inspired. Do they believe that or do they believe that some portions are God's word and some are man's and all that other stuff, right? Number six, the doctrine of depravity. Over and over again, the Bible teaches us that we're sick. We have a sinful nature. The world we live in today wants to tell us, you know, we don't, we're not, there's nothing wrong with us. We just bring out the, bring out the goodness within you, right? It's all there. Just bring it out. Well, 
God says no. Ha! There's nothing good. Isaiah 1, verses 5 and 6. There's nothing. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint from the, from the sole of the foot to the head. You're, you're sick. Every single person is born into this world sick and, and with a sinful nature. And God had to judge that sinful nature. And, and God is telling us that, that God is telling us the truth about ourselves. We're sick and we need a savior. Number seven, the doctrine of the Trinity. Number eight, God as the creator. It's not, not evolution, no. God is the creator of all things. Number nine, the doctrine of a literal heaven and a literal hell. Do you know that Jesus, when he, in his gospel, in the gospels, Jesus spoke twice as much about hell as he did about heaven. You know why? Because hell is a real place and people go there when they die. To Jesus, hell is real. Well, it should be. <laughs> he created it. He made it. And people go there when they die. And people also go to heaven when they die. And the difference is, is believers, people who put their faith and trust in Christ, at what he did on the cross, they go to heaven. And, and we put our hope and trust in him. And, and unbelievers... There is a place called hell, and they will go there. You get liberals, they don't want to talk, teach about heaven and hell. They want to stay away from the subject. Very, very, uh, very offensive. But over and over again, the Bible teaches there is a heaven and there is a hell. And people go there when they die. Number 10, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in and lives within us. We're baptized in Christ. Number 11, the body of Christ. Number 12, the unlimited atonement. The unlimited atonement. Second uh, Corinthians 5, verse 19. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, the unlimited atonement that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the whole world. He didn't die just for... Only those who are going to get saved. He didn't just shed his blood for only the saved. No, he shed his blood and he died for everyone. Doesn't mean everyone is saved. Doesn't mean everyone will get saved. It just means that he paid for their sins so that now when a person stands before God at judgment day, it is no longer, no longer their sins which will keep them from heaven. What keeps them from heaven is rejecting the one who paid for their sins. That's why a person goes to hell, because they reject the one who paid for them. They're not going to go to hell because they were a murderer or a rapist or they were a wife beater or a husband nagger or whatever. It has nothing. No, a person doesn't go to hell because of their sin. Why? Because Jesus Christ paid for all sins. The sins of what? Over and over again, says the whole world, the whole world. Don't don't misinterpret that and, and try to fit it into your beliefs and say, well, it doesn't really mean the whole world. It just means those who were saved. I mean, why would God, why would God waste all that energy and waste all that time dying for those who are going to reject him? No. Paid for the sins of the whole world. And now the only thing that keeps a person from heaven is they reject the one who paid for their sins. And then number 13 is the doctrine of the literal blood. The doctrine of the literal blood. We're saved. We're saved by the blood of Christ, not by the death of Christ. We're not saved by the death of Christ. We're saved because he shed his blood. He shed his blood. That's what Hebrews is about. He shed his blood. Jesus Christ, there had to be a shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood, what? Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. No remission. All right, so these 13 cardinal doctrines, and, and, and you, you, may, you may know teachers and preachers or whatever, and they may not believe all of these. 
You get you you hear one of them and and you need need to seriously decide. You need to seriously pray to God. Say, listen, God, do you still want me to be here or not? This guy doesn't believe in in this doctrine. This guy doesn't believe in that doctrine, right? And and so we need to teach the whole truth of God, not just what we think is not what we think or what makes us feel good or what's good with the world around us. No, the world around us is sick. They've got a sinful nature just like we do. The world around us is sick. And God's, God's telling the world, you're all sick. And that's why I came to die on the cross and shed my blood so that you can put your faith in Christ, in Christ and be saved. God did all of it because he doesn't want us to go to hell. He wants us to spend eternity with him in heaven forevermore. So he says here in verse 3, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. And we need teachers who will teach us the whole counsel of God about the blood of Christ, about the second coming of Christ, about the body of Christ, about the Holy Spirit, right? About, the, the, about everything in the word of God. All these 13 cardinal doctrines of the faith. And, and each teacher, each, each preacher of the gospel needs to have a firm grasp on these things. The unlimited atonement. God is the creator. So, Anyways, I was going to get into verse four, but we're going to uh, we'll get into that next lesson. But until then, walk with the Lord. I know he walks with you.